Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, it's an honor to be, to be speaking at the 2018 Blue Water Symposium. Uh, this is a, a bit of a, a joyous occasion for me. Um, I defended my PhD a couple weeks ago and uh, the Blue Water's fellowship uh, and support of the amazing staff of the NCSA really played a significant part uh, in the final lap uh, of my PhD. So it's really wonderful to be here and be able to share uh, some of the work that I've done with, with my collaborators, uh, both within and, and without of my lab uh, in the past few years. So I'm going to be talking about really uh, two, two very, very different approaches for predicting the properties of small molecules with different artificial intelligence approaches. The first 70% or so of my talk will be focused more on deep neural networks. The latter 30% or so will be focused more on molecular dynamics and more traditional machine learning approaches. So there has been an explosion of interest in this concept of using artificial intelligence for drug discovery. Uh, as you can see by this uh, rather quantitative trend, thanks to Google Trends starting in, in mid-2017, coming out of nowhere. And I think it's here to stay. I, I think the reason for this explosion in excitement is largely due to the unmitigated success of artificial intelligence in the field of computer vision. Uh, here we see the error rates on, in image classification on the MNIST dataset uh, from the late 90s to the present. We see that the error rate decreased rather precipitously starting in the early 2000s, and that's I wouldn't say that's really because of something general like artificial intelligence, which is really a catch-all phrase, but rather because computer scientists figured out the most natural representation of images, in this case, grids of pixels and three color channels. And then once they had that representation, they came up with a specific deep neural network architecture, in this case, the convolutional neural network that efficiently leverages the notion of pixel proximity correlating with spatial proximity to learn the features relevant to image classification in later layers of a neural network. In this case here, if uh, a network is given a picture of a car, particularly relevant today given the self-driving car movement, we see that earlier layers of a neural network learn simple features like edges, whereas later layers learn more complex features like wheels and windshields and ultimately make and model. The other rather unmitigated success of artificial intelligence uh, as of late has been in the landscape of natural language processing. Uh, those of you who have been using Google Translate, uh, those especially in, in, my, uh, in, in my age group remember using Google Translate to help their high school Spanish or, or French homework and noting that it wasn't very good, it was not very useful. Um, and all of a sudden, two years ago, Google Translate became awesome. And uh, that really isn't because of AI as a general concept. But again, more specifically, computer scientists came up with a natural representation of text, in this case being one hot vectors representing each word. And the recurrent neural network was able to more efficiently uh, uh, transfer uh, um, different aspects of text from short and longer term interactions to be able to do this translation. So that leads to the question relevant to the folks in biosciences in this room. Um, if the convolutional neural network and images uh, was really helpful for vision and the recurrent neural network was the key advance for natural language, what is the right approach for molecules? So in this part of the talk, we're going to briefly go over representations of molecules that we think are most efficient, how to leverage those representations with certain deep neural network architectures, uh, and then we're going to discuss uh, how these networks perform in some somewhat real world classification and regression tasks. So myself and my colleagues in the lab of Vijay Pandey think that the most natural representation of a molecule is as a graph where each node is an atom and each edge is a different bond. We can represent this graph by an adjacency matrix A, which is square n by n matrix, where a one encodes a bond and a zero encodes no bond, um, and a feature matrix X, where each row is a different atom and each column is a different feature. 
For example, if you look at propanamid on the top right of the screen here, um, we see that in the third row, representing the carbonyl carbon, we have the most ones because it has the most bonds to other atoms. Uh, and if you look at the X matrix, we see that we can represent this molecule with very, very simple features for each atom. In this case, whether it's a carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen, and whether it's sp2 or sp3 hybridized. And this rather completely uh, denotes uh, this molecule. It, it completely allows us to, to be able to write it down, given only this information. So uh, in the last talk, we, we heard um, some nice applications of, of NLPs. Um, so thank you for the introduction to that. Uh, uh, by analogy, the graph convolutional framework uh, inserts an additional matrix A, this n by n adjacency matrix, between the weight matrix and the feature matrix. So in the multilayer perceptron space, one would represent a molecule as a single flat vector of features. Whereas in the graph convolutional framework, we instead represent our molecule as these two matrices, n by n for bonds and uh, n by p for features for each atom. And in each layer of a neural network, we learn how to pass information from atoms to other atoms through bonds as the edges. Uh, we translated an um, advance from the uh, space of natural language uh, called the recurrent neural network. Um, uh, that we discussed earlier uh, to make that message passing even more efficient between atoms. So the fundamental theorem of drug discovery is really that there is a certain biological target of interest, mostly a protein, sometimes nucleic acids, and we would like to develop a small molecule or an antibody that binds to that biological target of interest. So really, uh, a single graph is not enough. We need to learn how to represent interacting molecules if we want to fully be able to predict the efficacy of a given drug. And for this, we generalize the notion of an adjacency matrix from an n by n matrix A to an n by n by a number of edge types adjacency tensor. And continuing with our theme, we developed what we, what we call the staged spatial graph convolution to leverage that representation. Now, the first stage of uh, the staged spatial graph convolution one only uses information from the bonded information to learn. Um, uh, can, can the audience raise their hand if, if you've done a molecular dynamic simulation in the past? Ah, uh, yes, I know my audience. Uh, and uh, you know the first step of running an MD simulation is to get your atom types so you can compute what your force field is before you run the simulation. Analogously here in stage one of our neural network, uh, we derive differentiable atom types for each atom. So instead of a single one-hot vector uh, that encodes whether or not you're, um, you know, let's say a carbonyl carbon in an asparagine, instead here we have a dense vector of features that represent each atom. And in the second stage, we, we include both bonded and non-bonded information. In the final stage, uh, fully connected layers over the ligand itself to compute a free energy value. So um, we put out a paper called MoleculeNet in the past year, which is supposed to be analogous to ImageNet, to uh, uh, you know, noting the fact that science really advances by apples to apples comparison. We wanted to find a way so that different labs uh, across the world can benchmark their own machine learning methods against each other to see how they're performing. Now, drug discovery is really, even though I would say the fundamental theorem is binding some biological target with some exogenous molecule, uh, really its drug development is a multi-parameter optimization problem, which ranges all the way from the picometer to angstrom scale of uh, performing quantum mechanical calculations to parameterize a force field uh, through measuring the solubility of a ligand, which is more on the angstrom scale, to the biophysical, uh, where one has to measure protein ligand binding affinity, that happens more at the nanometer scale, all the way through the toxicity properties of a molecule, which happens in the centimeter to the meter scale. So uh, with, with that in mind, we wanted to see how our methods could be applied to uh, predict these different key tasks in this multi-parameter optimization problem discovery. So, in terms of protein ligand binding affinity, we use the PDB bind data set 
Uh, the 2007 version is what everyone else in the literature uses, so we use it as well, even though there are more recent ones that you can download. So um, as opposed to the image space, where ImageNet holds 14 million labeled images to train and to evaluate your deep neural network, uh, in this case, we're constrained to the mere 1,300 examples in PDB bind, so several orders of magnitude less data available. Uh, our method performs uh, with, within statistical equivalency to uh, another deep neural network approach that came out in the last year, um, although they do not use a, a test set but only really use a more cross-validation approach. Uh, we rather rigorously divided our training data into separate training, validation, and test sets where one optimizes hyperparameters over the validation set and only looks at the test set once. Um, but uh, an interesting note uh, for, for those in the field is that our ligand-only control, where we throw away any information about the protein, uh, achieves a Pearson R of 0.65, which is pretty good, and shows you that there's a lot of information in, in just this concept of what makes a good ligand and what makes a bad ligand in terms of drug-like molecules. Uh, we also applied our approaches uh, for toxicity, solubility, and quantum mechanical property prediction, and uh, we were really excited to see rather systematic improvement in performance for all these different tasks. Um, the latter three uh, challenges I showed here are not published yet, so you're one of the first people to see it, uh, but we're, we're probably going to put this in our, our second version of this archive paper uh, relatively soon. So we were really excited about this, how we were able to develop highly optimized software uh, for which I thank some of the students I work with who have really helped debug and to opti further optimize our code uh, to predict uh, many different length scale associated properties that are important for drug discovery. But deep neural networks are not, are not everything. Uh, we had a great conversation over dinner last night actually about the importance of, of uh, tailoring the algorithm that you're applying to a problem based on what the biology is. And, and uh, the relevant domain expertise really becomes relevant here. So in this case, we know that G-protein coupled receptors, which comprise a third of all FDA approved uh, drug targets, uh, are quite dynamic creatures. They're not static structures like we see in our biology textbooks. Here we have only a couple hundred nanoseconds of simulation uh, from a millisecond of simulation data set of uh, a buprenorphine-like molecule interacting with a mu opioid receptor. We see in only a couple hundred nanoseconds the ligand inducing quite a significant conformation change in the binding pocket. Uh, and if drug targets, kinases, GPCRs sample so many different conformations, it really begs the question, uh, why so many different pharma companies and academic labs still dock to single crystal structures. Though I feel like I'm preaching the choir, uh, being in a molecular dynamics focused room here, uh, where everyone here also has bought into our collective narrative of the importance of conformational heterogeneity in proteins. Uh, so we wanted to come up with a systematic way where we can exploit that conformational heterogeneity that we can see in atomic detail from MD simulation uh, to systematically discover molecules. So we took the millisecond of MD simulation of the mu opioid receptor bound to several different ligands, uh, including members of the buprenorphine class uh, and members of the fentanyl class, and applied an unsupervised machine learning approach called TICA, which is similar to PCA. Uh, PCA optimizes for the variance of degrees of freedom. TICA optimizes for the kinetic slowness and we can reduce the dimensionality of our system uh, from 60,000 atoms with you know, different XYZ coordinates down to just a couple of key order parameters here that we call ticks, just like you might see PCs in a genomics paper. And we can see by projecting our millisecond of simulation onto this really nice uh, reduced landscape how different ligands, different classes induce the receptor or perhaps conformationally select the receptor to explore different regions of phase space. So once we can get our million or so conformations from MD down to a key series of 25 conformations uh, that we uh, extract out from this TICA unsupervised approach and from k-means clustering, 
We can then dock a library of known ligands, uh, known opioid ligands that we just got from Kemble uh, and PubChem where we know whether or not they bind and we know whether or not they're agonists. And we can generate this feature matrix where each row in the matrix is a different ligand and each column is a different conformational state of the receptor and each entry in the feature matrix is the docking score of ligand I to conformation J. And we can build a random forest model uh, that is able to, in a supervised manner, map these series of docking scores of a given ligand toward a given set of states to whether or not it's a binder, and if it's a binder, whether or not it's an agonist or antagonist for the receptor. And we were excited to see rather significant improvements in ROC AUC as our, met as our metric for classification for whether or not a given ligand that we've never seen before is a binder or an agonist. And that's not only true for random split, but also for the much harder challenge of taking away ligands of any given scaffold that the supervised model has never seen before and seeing uh, if we can predict, for example, if we never have seen a fentanyl-like compound, if we can know if fentanyl binds and whether or not it's an agonist. It's just an interesting test case. We all know from the news now that fentanyl and uh, analogous molecules are some of the most potent binders and agonists to the mu opioid receptor. If one docks this molecule to either of the crystal structures, one would get such a poor docking score that you would never purchase this compound and see if it was real. So we would totally miss the fentanyl series uh, by traditional uh, docking to crystal structures, but docking with MD and a little bit of machine learning really recovers that. As a former experimentalist myself, like I know several are in this room, I didn't really believe in our results until I could see this make a prediction in the laboratory that would be tested and verified. So we wanted to see if we can discover a new opioid-like molecule with our approach. So we took a library of 135,000 molecules from the Stanford Compound Library and docked all of those compounds to 25 different conformations of the receptor from MD in addition to the crystal structures. We applied our random forest based ranking system, and we took the 30 compounds ranked as most likely to be both a binder and an agonist uh, to our wonderful colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York to experimentally test. And we were excited to discover a new series of opioid agonists that is quite different from what's been known previously. Um, all of the, uh, let's say, famous uh, opioids that one might have read about in the news or learned about in pharmacology, uh, ranging from the morphinans to the fentanyls to methadones, um, all have this tertiary amine nitrogen uh, that binds to a certain aspartate in the binding pocket. Our molecule, FMP4, lacks this classic tertiary amine nitrogen, uh, which we were extremely excited about because our primary goal is to see if we can leverage conformational heterogeneity to find molecules of a fundamentally new scaffold. When you think about it, crystals or co-crystal structures, I should say, are quite biased toward the ligands to which they are bound, uh, which it would make sense might have some fundamental constraints on the new chemotypes that one can discover with that given conformation. Uh, here we docked our ligand FMP4 um, uh, into the pocket, um, and uh, here I'm just depicting the confirmation to which it had the predicted highest docking score. And uh, we see here that uh, without the movement of this histidine in the binding pocket, the steric hindrance would just simply be too high for our molecule FMP4 to bind to the pocket in the crystal structure shown in green here. Uh, whereas in our MD snapshot shown in blue here, uh, it is able to engage in that critical interaction with the histidine necessary uh, for binding. Um, although I'd, I'd like to wait for further experiments before uh, uh, I get too confident about the specific binding mode. So uh, my conclusion might seem like pandering, but uh, it's real. Um, I think that you know, people in the audience have, have been in the field for decades, and, and um, you know, we've all seen different algorithms, different approaches rise and fall over the years. Um, molecular dynamics, of course, is, is I, I think, in the productive phase of the hype cycle, uh, but deep neural networks are, are sort of at the peak of this hype cycle right now, and, and we don't even know in 10 or 20 years what, what the next, um, next exciting approach will be. But at the end of the day, the reason why we're able to have these advances 
and to be able to apply specific algorithms to specific biological problems is that there's the data that's become available from experimentalists and there's the hardware advances available in such great supercomputers as Blue Waters that allows us to train and test our models um, on systems. So, so really at the end of the day, uh, my conclusion is use what works for the problem at hand um, and to really help support the advances in hardware that have enabled all of this to be possible. So I'd like to, uh, first, if those of you were interested, here are the different uh, papers relevant to this talk that I've worked on uh, throughout my PhD, and, and many, many, many thanks to the co-authors and to those acknowledged in all those papers. I could not have done it without them. I'd like to thank the different computing resources and funding that had been essential for uh, my PhD. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Brunner, my point of contact specifically for being so helpful for getting things up and running. Uh, we use Blue Waters specifically for um, a lot of ligand parameterization uh, for, this, for this project and to find the right poses. Uh, but primarily, I've been using my allocation for deep neural network training. So if you're interested in getting involved with that, um, I spent a whole day getting that up and running, so I like to not spend a whole day for you. So feel free to send me an email, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly how I got it going. Um, I'd like to thank my committee, who uh, has been very supportive and influential in what I've told you about today, uh, and all my lab mates for making PhD a very, very fun experience. If you ever visit our lab on Halloween, um, know that DJ doesn't always dress in clown costumes, um, but uh, you may uh, get a look of some very, very interesting get-ups if you come visit us at the end of October. <laughs>